They avoid situations that might intensify their anxiety or sense of being out of control. They might even self-injure to try to break through their dissociation or their numbness. And often the behaviors that bring people into therapy are secondary to the trauma-based symptoms or to the trauma itself. What is EMDR and how can it be used to help those who've experienced trauma recover and live their optimal lives? Let's talk all about it with author and clinical psychologist Deborah Korn right here on episode 395 of The Nurse Keith Show. Well, hello there. This is Nurse Keith. This podcast is always about you, your personal and professional development, your nursing and healthcare career, and the healthcare system in the bigger, bigger picture. And I'm here to share education, ideas, diatribes, and informative interviews of some of the most inspiring people from the worlds of healthcare, nursing, entrepreneurship, medicine, and beyond. I love having you along for the ride. And I thank you from the bottom of my nurse podcaster's heart for being part of the growing Nurse Keith Nation. If you'd like to help other people find this show, do me a solid and leaving a rating and review over on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon, Spotify, and anywhere you happen to find the show, please feel free to share it with others who you think would benefit from it. And if you'd like to become a patron, head over to patreon.com forward slash nurse Keith. It really, really helps me continue to bring the show to as many people as possible. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash nurse Keith. I am here today with Deborah Korn. She's a clinical psychologist and author. And if you'd like to learn more about Deborah, head over to the drop down menu at nursekeith.com under podcasts, or just look at the show notes in whatever app you're using. And Deborah, you've written a book, and the book is called Every Memory Deserves Respect, and it is all about EMDR therapy. And I'm a veteran of having received EMDR, and we can talk about that a little bit. But could you please start with defining what truly is EMDR? Because some people out there might not have heard of it. Mm Mm-hmm. Sure. First of all, thanks so much for having me on the show. It's just it's just an absolute pleasure to be here with you. So EMDR stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Let me break that down a little bit. Desensitization refers to the reduction of distress, fear, anxiety. Reprocessing refers to the reevaluation or the restructuring of thoughts and beliefs and the transformation of one's sense of self relative to past traumatic experiences. It's about moving the past into the past. And then there's the eye movement component. Now, Francine Shapiro, the developer of EMDR, accidentally discovered that purposely moving your eyes horizontally back and forth while focusing on a traumatic memory leads to a reduction in the vividness and the emotional intensity of the memory. She developed an effective protocol for treating PTSD and trauma-related problems using this bilateral back and forth eye movement stimulation and published the first research study on this approach in 1989, working with rape survivors and Vietnam combat veterans, hence the name eye movement, desensitization and reprocessing. Now, EMDR is a memory-focused psychotherapy that helps people deal with the impact and the legacy of trauma and adverse experiences in their lives. And it's based on the idea that psychological problems are related to a failure to adequately process traumatic experiences or memories. Now, these unprocessed traumatic memories, frozen or locked in our nervous system, continue to affect how we perceive things, decisions we make, reactions we have, the beliefs we hold about ourselves and others. And uh, present day triggers, people, places, things that somehow remind a person of a traumatic experience. These present day triggers um, activate these unprocessed traumatic memories leading to symptoms that cause ongoing distress. And in EMDR therapy, we help clients access and activate their traumatic memories with a set of focused questions, questions like, 
What picture represents the worst part of that memory in your mind? What's the negative belief about yourself that comes up with that memory? What are the feelings? What are the sensations that come up? And then we jumpstart the brain's information processing system using bilateral simulation. With EMDR reprocessing, a client's distress eventually decreases and relevant adaptive bits of information located in other parts of the brain, helpful present day perspectives get integrated. So by the time we've moved through this work, the client arrives at a place where they can genuinely say and feel it's over. I'm safe now. You know, I was I was only a kid doing the best that I could. It actually wasn't my fault. I'm okay. I'm good enough. I'm in control now. I have choices. So we've moved the past into the past. And there are there's shifts in thoughts, in feelings, in behaviors, and physical sensations. And healing involves spontaneous movement toward more positive thinking and more manageable feelings and a significant reduction in the level of disturbance experienced in one's body. Wow, that is a great, great description. I know a fair amount about it from personal experience. Mm -hmm. I actually was the recipient of EMDR therapy back in um, 2002 after my best friend was murdered. And it Mm -hmm. was very, very helpful. And um, it it really did move things along for me very, very quickly. Mm-hmm. And it was a very traumatic experience. And it's a long story that I don't need yeah. to tell here, but it was incredibly helpful. And I've had clients over the years who've experienced EMDR and also friends and loved ones as well. So I'm familiar, I'm a fan, <laughs> and mm-hmm. I know there's research there's, you said it dates back to the 80s when this first kind of came to light that this was possible. Yeah. And you've written a book, which is actually a really fascinating book because it's not only written by a clinical psychologist, there's also aspects of it written by someone who's received it as a patient. So yes. how did this book come about? Like why, why a book written by both a patient and a psychologist? Yeah, great question. Well, the the inspiration for this book came from my co-author, Michael Baldwin. Um, Michael spent about two years in EMDR treatment with my colleague, Dr. Jeffrey Magnavita. Michael was not my client, but he spent two years in treatment with Jeffrey Magnavita, dealing with symptoms related to a history of childhood abuse and neglect. And over the course of this treatment, Michael started to conjure up images associated with various trauma-related and recovery-related concepts, and he went looking for photographs that aligned with these mental images. And he ultimately shared a handful of those photographs with his therapist who said, you have the basis for a book here. There's really something powerful here in these images. And so Michael started to imagine a book in which he'd pair up with a professional to discuss his own trauma history and experience with EMDR. And the professional, who became me, uh, Mm -hmm. would provide the didactic part about trauma treatment, EMDR, and the process of recovery. And in thinking about creating a book, Michael had the hope that after hearing his story and the experiences of other clients discussed in the book, uh, clients that I talk about in the book, people would feel more comfortable talking about their own stories and ultimately in seeking help. So Michael contacted me and his story and his idea for a book were so compelling that I couldn't resist. And I immediately got excited about creating an EMDR book unlike anything that had ever come before, one that my clients would actually read that would something that would pull them in, um, one that I could share with my parents who've never really understood what I do for a living, mm-hmm. and one that I could share with my primary care doctor and my chiropractor who've been asking me questions about trauma and EMDR for years. And I just imagined from the very beginning a truly accessible and user-friendly book. And for me, writing a book like this was a way for me to combine my commitment to mental health advocacy and education with my love for trauma-informed clinical work and teaching and EMDR therapy. And for Michael, you know, he really had the hope from the very beginning um, uh, that men in particular would read our book and hear his story and understand 
that trauma may be at the root of many of their symptoms and behavior patterns. His sense was that men in particular often need permission or encouragement to share their vulnerability and to seek help. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And it is very effective the way the book is put together. It's visually very um, Mm. attractive. You know, you have these um, pages with, you know, nice colorful lists and then you have nice images and Mm -hmm. it goes from you to Michael, you know, there's, there's different, different sections. So it's easy to read. It's easy to absorb and you get the didactic part from you. And then you get the, you know, experiential part from Michael, which is a really nice, it's a nice balance. You don't see that a whole much, whole bunch. Yeah. We thought that it was, it was a unique format that offered something different and it really is kind of, two books in one, right? Mm-hmm. There, it's a picture book. And we call we call these images with the little bit of text on the opposite page, we call them billboards. So mm-hmm. this it's this book of billboards with public service announcements, so to speak. And then it's a narrative and uh, a, a written text. And it really is um, a discussion of trauma recovery and EMDR from two very different perspectives, from the perspective of an EMDR therapist and so-called expert and from a client. Yeah, I I I really like it. I'm going to recommend it to a lot of people and oh, to my you. listeners of course and it's at everymemorydeservesrespect.com and of course it's on Amazon and all the other yep. places that one finds books mm-hmm. these days. Now, we're we're talking about terms that you know vast, vast majority of my listeners are nurses, maybe nursing students, and some other professionals and non-professionals as well. But in your words, how would you describe the term trauma? Because it's Mm. a word that gets bandied about a lot. Absolutely. What would be your clinical definition of the word trauma? Well, you know, trauma is a part of life. 70% of adults have experienced at least one significant trauma, probably more than that. Um, In our book, we define trauma as any experience that feels overwhelming, triggers strong negative emotions like shame or terror, and involves a sense of powerlessness or intense vulnerability. And I always like to say that trauma is both objective and subjective. It's both the event itself and the experience of the event. So no two people are going to experience the same event or series of events in the same way. So it's not just what happened to you, but also what happens inside of you, what happens within you when you have that experience or after you have that experience. And we we really know that the greater the number of traumas that someone is exposed to, the greater the psychological and physical toll. We know that trauma is cumulative. We know that it's developmentally bound, meaning children and adolescents are much more vulnerable to the effects of trauma than adults. And We also, um, when we talk about trauma, we tend to talk about big T traumas and little t traumas. Um, So big T traumas are the events that most anyone would consider traumatic, right? What we call shock traumas, where the person perceives a potential threat to their survival or the survival of loved ones. So childhood sexual, physical, or emotional abuse, um, rape, physical assault, the traumatic death or murder of a loved one, thinking about your history, uh, combat-related trauma, devastation related to environmental disaster, witnessing violence. Um, And then little t traumas are those experiences that people might not necessarily recognize as traumatic or events that might not necessarily meet the official DSM criteria for so-called trauma, diagnostic manual criteria. Um, So here we're talking about exposure to criticism or covert bullying or experiences of betrayal or experiences Mm -hmm. involving um, humiliation Mm -hmm. or failure or aloneness or subtle- Systemic racism. I was going to say yeah. microaggressions as yes. well as blatant discrimination or hostility, right? Related to race or ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, appearance. Hmm. Um, so, you know, in, in, adult, in adulthood, the kinds of examples of little T traumas, uh, a divorce, losing a job, a bad 
performance review, a difficult move, the discovery of a partner's affair, examples in childhood um, might be feeling ignored, feeling different or unable to measure up or um, powerlessness to control the craziness or the chaos in your family. And probably the last thing I want to say about trauma is that it involves both omission and commission. Mm-hmm. What we mean by that is that um, when, we, when we talk about commission, we're talking about things that happen to you, things that are committed against you. So an assault, right? Abuse, a car accident. When we talk about omission, we talk about situations where things were supposed to happen, but didn't. Situations where someone was not properly protected, where someone was not listened to or cared for or valued, uh, experiences of neglect, deprivation, abandonment, alienation, discrimination. And I, you know, when I think about all of the nurses listening, I think about all of the things didn't happen or haven't happened in hospital settings during the pandemic. You know, the the lack of support, the lack of supplies, the lack of attending to what it was like for them and the burnout that so many of them were experiencing. You, You can speak much more about that. But I, as I was thinking about this program today and thinking about, um, omission and commission, I was thinking about all the things that don't happen in our world and how that can be equally traumatic, if not more at times, more traumatic at times. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for mentioning that. And I was going to get to that for sure, because so many of my listeners are nurses and you just hit the nail on the head. So we've, you know, the pandemic's not over, huge quote marks around over, but you know, that, that first, well, let's say traumatic couple of years of the pandemic, especially 2020, when it was sort of the wild west and nobody Absolutely. knew what was happening from mm-hmm. not even day to day, moment to moment. I mean, things were, there was such, such levels of uncertainty and mm-hmm. what a lot of nurses talk about and write about, and I'm sure yeah. you've been seeing this and, and others too, you know, people who work in social work and psychology and um, chaplaincy, they talk about moral and ethical dilemmas and and moral injury, you know, think about the nurses in the COVID units who had to be the family for the dying patient. And maybe the family was watching or talking over an iPad, which goes completely against everything we've ever been taught in nursing school or any other type of healthcare education. Mm -hmm. So When I think about that, those are little traumas and big traumas. Yes, (laughs) exactly. So for a nurse who's been through that and is in this place of, they've faced such moral and ethical uh, um, dilemmas dilemmas and Mm. and pain, right? As as a witness and also a caregiver. Yes. And they're feeling compassion fatigue because they feel like, oh my gosh, I can't do this anymore. However, yes. at the same time, ethically, how can I abandon my my colleagues at this time? Right. You know, because life goes on and and people need care. So when it comes to trauma and it comes to let's talk about EMDR, because that's what we're here to talk about. Yes. What do you feel like can help a nurse when let's see, say these traumatic memories are frozen. They're locked in the nervous system. They're having symptoms associated with post-traumatic stress. So what can happen with this, let's say this fictitious nurse who wants to pursue treatment and wants to be able to, you know, go about their personal and professional lives and feel okay. What could that look like for them? Yeah. Well, first, I just want to say that since the start of the pandemic, I've had the privilege of working with a number of doctors and nurses who came for EMDR therapy precisely to deal with the kinds of things you're describing. So I do have firsthand experience with that. And, um, you know, I, I feel really good about what we were able to do together in EMDR treatment. And, you know, every single doctor and nurse who came through uh, was able to return to work feeling 
uh, feeling like they had stamina again, they had perspective again, they had, you know, the commitment um, in their heart to return mm -hmm. to this work in a way that felt good to them. So, um, you know, basically, uh, in each of those cases, we took a look at the situations that were haunting them, you know, the situations that were continuing to haunt them through flashbacks or nightmares or ruminations or, you know, ethical, moral struggles in their heart of hearts. Um, we looked at, you know, uh, events that were troubling them uh, and those became our initial targets, what we call a target in EMDR therapy. So we targeted those moments with the family on a Zoom call where they had to bear witness to the excruciating pain that this family was experiencing, unable to reach and touch their loved one. You know, we targeted experiences where they had to make these moment to moment difficult decisions, and they didn't always feel good about those decisions. We targeted interactions that they had with uh, administration where they were, were told, no, we can, we do not have more support for you. We do not have more supplies for you. Do with what you have. Um, you know, we targeted uh, some of the losses, some of the deaths um, that they had to deal with. And for some of them, they felt deaths that could have been prevented. And in each of those cases, we looked at, we, we activated the memory with a series of questions, as I said, you know, what picture represents the worst part? What's the negative belief about yourself? I'm powerless. It's my fault. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't carry on, right? I, uh, I don't deserve to live was as severe as it got for one of these mm. women that I was working with. Um, and we look at the feelings, we look at the grief, the anger, the outrage, the despair um, that was connected to some of these experiences and where that's being held in the body, how that's being held in the body. And then we begin to process and we begin to process by bringing in bilateral stimulation, back and forth eye movement that jump starts the brain's information processing system. And we help people move through those feelings, those thoughts, the experiences themselves. Again, no two people process in the same way, but ultimately by the end of the work, the distress is down and folks are able to endorse a new, more positive belief, right? Uh, I'm okay, it's not my fault. I have a lot to offer. You know, many of the nurses and doctors that I work with, that's where they landed at the end of the work. Even though I've been through horrible things, I've seen horrible things, I am able to heal and I have a lot to offer. This is my chosen profession. You know, I want, I'm ready and I want to return. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's, that's powerful. And I'm, I'm so glad you've done that work. Well, thank you for doing that work, mm. first of all. Mm, of course. And, you know, keeping frontline workers in the game is a large, it's a service to society, first of mm. all. Mm. Um, all of us, well, almost all of us end up patients at some point. And we need people on the other side of the stethoscope to take care of us when we're sick, yeah. first of all. Yeah. And we need a healthy healthcare workforce, whether it's clinical psychologists or nurses or nurses aides or chaplains, whoever it happens to be, we need them to be healthy too. And we can't have people be victims of their profession. And it feels like a lot of nurses listening right now are probably like, yeah, they heard the words you were talking about, despair and, yeah. you know, unhappiness and trauma and, you know, grief. And, you know, it, this it's not what we signed up for, though we no. know that healthcare is, it's a tough world and human services are a tough world to live and work in. Yeah. And when we come back from the break, there's a an excerpt from the book I would love to have you read because I always like listeners to hear part of the writing in the author's voice. There's nothing better. And then I want to talk to you a little bit more about, about the, the ways in which you see EMDR really having an impact on public health, on 
the violence in our society around us, which Mm -hmm. we hear about all the time, Mm -hmm. and some other questions I have for you to kind of elucidate a little bit more about this. Does that sound like a good plan? Sounds great. Okay. So please hang out with us here and come back for the second half of episode 395 with clinical psychologist and author, Deborah Korn. We will be right back. Hey, everyone. Let's take a quick pause for the cause, shall we? Thanks for being a valued listener of The Nurse Keith Show. And if you'd like to help other people find the podcast, please consider leaving a rating and review over on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. This really helps propel the show and grow our audience. And I truly appreciate everyone who's already taken the time. And if leaving a public rating review isn't your thing, why not tell a colleague about the Nurse Keys show by sending them a link so they can listen for themselves? After all, word of mouth is the most organic way for me to reach those who truly need to tune in. So if you'd like to do me a solid, please consider leaving a rating review or telling a friend or colleague. And by doing so, you'll be helping the Nurse Keith Show reach more and more nurses and healthcare professionals all around the world. Now, let's get back to today's conversation. And welcome back to the second half of the episode. We're here again with friend of the pod and my new friend and colleague, Deborah Korn, clinical psychologist and author. And Deborah, right before the break, we were talking about what nurses and healthcare providers have been through over these last several years. And you were also talking about just the the basics of EMDR therapy, what it is, and differences between those big T and little t traumas. But where I'd like to begin right now, as I mentioned before the break, was have you read an excerpt from the book? And again, Mm -hmm. it is a beautiful book. Every memory deserves respect. And I would love folks to check it out. And hearing it in your voice, there's, there's nothing better. So if you would do us the honor of reading that excerpt, that would be lovely. Sure. So this is a section in the book called How Trauma Eventually Catches Up With Us. Some people enter trauma treatment soon after a traumatic experience, within weeks or months. Many others come into treatment after being able to function well enough for many years, able to manage and move their lives along. Perhaps they were fortunate enough to have some kind of anchor, like a healthy relationship or a rewarding job, but eventually some challenge or transition, a loss, an illness, a move, a downsizing, tips their nervous system into a place where whatever had been running just below the surface starts to intrude. Those strategies that had kept emotions and memories in check stop working. When I respond to inquiries about treatment, I hear things like, lately I can't sleep. I can't eat. I'm really short-tempered. I just can't get out of bed. I can't concentrate and I'm worried that I'm going to get fired. My husband pointed out that I'm washing my hands like a hundred times a day. I'm just deeply unhappy. I feel scared all the time. I suddenly can't get my abusive father out of my mind. It can even be something in the news that overloads or triggers their nervous system. My phone started ringing off the hook after 9-11. Even for people who hadn't been in New York or Washington, D.C., and didn't know anyone who had died. The terrorist attacks quickly, and in some cases, unexpectedly brought up feelings of danger, unpredictability, and evil, which stirred up childhood trauma memories they hadn't thought about in years, or in some cases, hadn't even previously remembered. News reports about Harvey Weinstein, Michael Jackson, Jeffrey Epstein, Brett Kavanaugh, Bill Cosby, and those accused in the clergy abuse scandals regularly found their way into weekly therapy sessions because they stirred up old feelings of helplessness and hopelessness, memories of not being believed, and the sense of impotence and invisibility that came when attempts were made to confront those in power. The coronavirus pandemic is yet another big T trauma that has affected us all. Research tells us that certain factors are likely to dramatically increase fear and perceptions of acute danger. When a threat is new and unfamiliar, 
when people believe they have little control over the threat, and when they experience a feeling of dread. The COVID-19 crisis contains all of these elements. For individuals with significant trauma histories or those who were already living in unsafe or unstable environments, the stress of the pandemic was the straw that broke the camel's back. The sense of vulnerability, uncertainty, and terror that marked the early months of the pandemic triggered memories of previous adversity, loss, and for some, life-threatening encounters. For the client who was a POW in Vietnam and for the survivor of domestic violence, the stay-at-home orders activated memories of captivity and powerlessness, as well as childhood memories of isolation and loneliness. For others, reading about COVID-19 patients who had died alone without their families brought up unresolved feelings of grief and at times guilt about the loss of friends and family members to overdoses, suicide, and illness. The loss of jobs and financial security during this period has created tremendous anxiety for people and has reactivated memories of times when the rug was unexpectedly pulled out from under their feet. Thank you, Deborah. Wow, that captures so much of people's lived experience these days. And just recently, we're recording this at the end of October 2022. Just recently, there have been stories in the news of, sadly, tragically, several nurses being killed on the job. Several were shot. Um, one has been stabbed mm. um, while working in a hospital. Yeah. And, you know, the the impact of that, I mean, first of all, we've had all the traumas you just mentioned, and the COVID-19 pandemic was more than enough for everyone. And then we layer on top of it, everything you just brought up, Harvey Weinstein, et cetera, et cetera, you know, the list goes on and on. Yeah. And then when nurses and other healthcare providers hear that their, their colleagues, their, their peers are being actually, you know, shot in in the workplace while going about the day-to-day activities of their work caring for patients in the ways they always have i mean how does that affect the brain like what goes on in the brain and body you know physiologically when we hear these stories and what does our body then do with that mhm well i think um that trauma is an injury to the brain. Let's just begin with that. Okay. That's a notion that somehow escapes many, many people that, you know, we have a, we have a billboard in the book that says we would no more expect someone to walk on a broken leg than we would expect someone to be able to continue functioning as they normally do after experiencing a trauma, because we're talking about a brain injury. So, um, So it's helpful to think of the brain as being made up of three smaller brains, the thinking brain, the emotional brain, and the instinctual brain or the reptilian brain. And the thinking brain is responsible for thinking and talking, remembering, reasoning, creating. The emotional brain is all about feeling, remembering, detecting threat, threat, interacting with others. And the instinctual brain is about sleeping, eating, breathing, heart rate, blood pressure. And in response to trauma, the emotional brain in conjunction with the instinctual brain mobilizes and winds up hijacking the thinking brain. The limbic system of the emotional brain goes into overdrive. The sympathetic nervous system automatically kicks into high gear and everything gets focused on survival. The brain prepares you to to fight or take flight, right? Your heart rate increases, your pupils dilate, your airways open wider. We become hyper-focused, scanning for danger, looking for escape routes, sometimes freezing when the threat feels particularly overwhelming and there's no possibility of escape. The thinking brain's executive control network gets suppressed, cutting out the thinking you, quote unquote, right? It cuts out the thinking 
you out of the decision-making loop. So ideally, after a trauma is over, the thinking brain is able to reestablish control. But in many cases, particularly when there's a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, the emotional brain remains stuck in overdrive and continues to inhibit the thinking brain's functions. People remain in high alert and particularly reactive to anything that reminds them of their trauma. The brain is not able to effectively evaluate whether someone or something is a real threat or not. And with prolonged or repeated exposure to traumas, this state of high activation that, you know, that we refer to as hyper arousal, freeze, fight, flight, becomes chronic, leading to anxiety, difficulties with self-regulation, irritability, aggression. And sometimes when the level of duration of stress becomes too great, a person's nervous system shifts into a shutdown or a collapse mode, what we call hypoarousal. And many complex traumatic stress disorders reflect this chronic state of immobilization. It shows up as uh, despair or hopelessness, numbing, dissociation. And of course, sometimes people turn to drugs or alcohol or food or sex or gambling or porn or other addictive behaviors to try to regulate their dysregulated nervous system. They avoid situations that might intensify their anxiety or sense of being out of control. They might even self-injure to try to break through their dissociation or their numbness. And, you know, often the behaviors that bring people into therapy are secondary to the trauma-based symptoms or to the trauma itself, um, you know, that really reflects a traumatized brain and nervous system. So there's complex layers of response happening in trauma. Yes. And like we talked about, there's big T and little t traumas. Mm-hmm. And there's there's memory-based trauma, something from way in the past. Yes. And then there's the things that are happening in the moment that we're exposed to either at work or in the yes. news or in social media, in yes. our families. So life in the 21st century is very complicated. Yes. And, you know, back a hundred years ago, you know, so many of these factors just didn't exist. You know, of course there was violence. There Mm -hmm. were all these, all these things were, you know, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of um, what I'm trying to say, things that happen in modern society that just are new to the human brain. And I can only imagine the, that level of physiological and psychic stress that's happening for so many of us. And I think for nurses and healthcare professionals in particular, there's, it feels like EMDR is one of those therapies that has an effective basis in research and anecdotal experience Mm -hmm. and literature Mm -hmm. and providers like you who practice it. And there's, there's a doorway here. There's like, there's a little light shining through a doorway that can provide some answers and that can provide some healing. Are you aware of any employers of healthcare providers slash nurses slash physicians, et cetera, who are actually using EMDR in the workplace, like within a employee assistance program or anything like that sort of as a institutional response? You know, I think there are a number of hospital systems that brought EMDR therapists into the hospital setting, typically on Zoom, to work with large groups of first-line workers, first-line providers. Um, That was absolutely happening uh, early in the pandemic and actually continued well into the pandemic. Um, You know, there are other, there are many other workplaces. I'm thinking of a number of different companies where I've given presentations and I've spoke with the employers um, who've been interested in bringing EMDR therapists onto their EAP team. Um, So it is happening and they're not necessarily jobs that are high risk or high trauma environments, um, but they have really just come to recognize that uh, trauma is a huge part of what people are dealing with. It has a huge impact on people's mental health, their productivity, their functioning. And so uh, I think 
employers are, you know, employers who are educated, who do their homework, um, have been very receptive to bringing EMDR into the workplace. Yeah, that's really good to hear. Yeah. Now, you're a, a PsyD, Doctor of Psychology, or Clinical Psychologist. You have a private practice in Cambridge, Mass., where I have mm-hmm. wonderful branch of my family in Cambridge down the street mm-hmm. from you. Mm-hmm. And you're on the faculty of the EMDR Institute in California and the Trauma the Trauma Research Foundation in Boston, and you're an EMDR International Association approved consultant, and you present nationally and internationally. Now, if someone wants to find an EMDR therapist, you sit, you mentioned working over Zoom, so people could mm-hmm. work with you, they could work with anyone, but how do you make sure you're getting an accredited, approved EMDR consultant? Mm-hmm. Well, first of all, let me just say that chapter seven, the last chapter in our book, mm-hmm. totally addresses this question. Like, okay, so you're ready to pursue EMDR therapy. How do you start? How do you interview? How do you find a therapist? How do you interview a therapist? What kind of questions is it important to ask? Where do you find resources? Um, so I just wanted to mention that. But Basically, uh, I send most people to the EMDR International Association website. They can get there through our website, everymemorydeservesrespect.com. We have links to the EMDRIA website, but EMDRIA has a directory called Find a Therapist Directory, and you can look for EMDR therapists uh, across the country. There's EMDR therapists in all 50 states and around the world, Mm -hmm. and um, There are different degrees of credentialing. Um, Someone who wants to get a higher level of credentialing can become certified, quote, certified. And then if someone wants to go even farther than that in terms of their level of study and practice and training, they can become uh, an EMDR consultant. So certified EMDR therapists and EMDR consultants are the highest credentialed folks. That said, probably most therapists that you'll find on the EMDR International Association website are not necessarily certified. It doesn't mean that they are missing training. It, mm-hmm. you know, they if they have completed the basic training in EMDR and they have continued with uh, continuing education over time, um, then they're quite equipped to sit with someone and uh, provide EMDR therapy. But it's from there, it's just a matter of interviewing that person and seeing if they have the kind of uh, expertise, experience, um, specialty uh, interests that someone's looking for. Okay. Thank you. Just like shopping for any kind of therapist or counselor. Yeah, absolutely. Really, basically. Now, um, I don't want to wind down, but we have to. And I have a question I want to ask you because this is a career podcast for nurses as well. And nurses often are looking for like, what's the next thing for me as a clinician? Yes. So let's say I'm a mental health psychiatric nurse practitioner, and I would actually like to study EMDR and be mm. able to utilize it in my practice. How would I go about that? Mm, I'm so glad you're asking that question. Um, So we do train nurses. Um, We we train mental health professionals that are on a licensure track. Mm -hmm. So someone, we train students who are on a licensure track. They're going to become a licensed mental health counselor or a licensed nurse practitioner or licensed uh, therapist of some sort. And um, I have been a member of the faculty of the EMDR Institute, which is Francine Shapiro's training institute. Uh, I've been on faculty for the last 29 years. We do trainings uh, all over. Uh, now the trainings are all virtual. They, they're they going very, very well. We've been amazed at how well the, the training format has been able to be delivered through uh, virtual means. Um, But folks can check out the EMDR Institute to find out about trainings. That's emdr.com, the EMDR Institute, or they can go again to emdria.org, the EMDR International Association.org. And uh, and EMDRIA has a listing of all EMDRIA approved training programs. Mm -hmm. So if the EMDR Institute isn't the right program for someone, 
then they should absolutely uh, take a look at other offerings to, through Emdria. Um, and I know there are nurses out there that are EMDR trainers. Uh, my colleague Kate Wheeler in Connecticut is uh, an, an EMDR approved trainer and she's a nurse and, uh, and teaches entire classes of nurses. That's really great to hear. And yeah. I just wanted to mention that because, you know, a lot of nurses out there love to learn new skills. They like to bring in new modalities. And, you know, there's this relatively holistic view of what psychiatric and mental health nursing can be. Yes. So there's there's plenty that we can bring on board. So thanks for elucidating that. Yes. Now, before we go, and I don't want to, but before we go, I have four quick questions I like to ask all my guests, yes. not directly related to what we've been talking about, but it's more to get to know you and have you reflect a little bit for us. Yeah. Are, you, are you game? I'm game. Okay. Yeah. So the first question is, how do you define success either personally or professionally? Mm. I think for me, success involves engagement in something that has deep meaning, you know, that is rewarding, that has deep meaning, uh, that allows me to feel like I'm pursuing my passion and I'm making a contribution to the world. And I think that success can play out personally or professionally. You know, I'm involved in, I'm involved in lots of social justice work, um, social activism work that's deeply meaningful, that is, you know, feels empowering and uh, like I'm making a contribution. You know, I hope that my relate, the relationships in my life are meaningful and that I offer, you know, uh, friendship and comfort and uh, companionship to people uh, and, um, you know, I really do hope that I'm contributing to toward a trauma informed society, you know, uh, that my work goes beyond just seeing people in my therapy office, but it's also about educating people, engaging in activism um, and, you know, doing things that are going to bring change. I'm sure you are. And thank you. That's really that's a lovely reflection. The second question is, could you name, or if you don't want to name them, you could just describe a person who's inspired you in the course of your life. They could be living, they could be dead, they could be famous. It could just be someone in your personal life who really touched you in some way. Mm. Well, the person who immediately came to mind was Francine Shapiro. Mm -hmm. I may even become emotional as I talk with her That's because okay. Francine passed away a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but she was an absolute pioneer. She was uh, a woman who, you know, trusted herself and trusted her perception that she had developed something that could really end suffering mm -hmm. around the world. And she, as a woman, and at a time where the world of psychotherapy and mental health treatment was not particularly open to anything that sounded uh, non-traditional in any way. Mm -hmm. She persisted. She persisted. Um, she Her mantra was always research, research, research. She knew that if EMDR was ever going to make it into the mainstream and get the respect that it deserved, we needed to get the research done to show that it is um, efficient and effective. And she was a beautiful human being who was a friend and a mentor and who, you know, believed in me when I was quite young in the field. Uh, and, uh, you know, she really pushed me to go out and do what I could do. That's, that's beautiful. Francine Shapiro, thank you. Now, the third question, penultimate question is, is there a book or it could even be a movie and it doesn't have to be an absolute favorite of any kind, but one that's had a major impact on the way you think or the way you live your life. Um, the book, uh, The Body Keeps the Score oh, yes. by Bessel van der Kolk is mm -hmm. popping into my mind. Mm -hmm. Bessel is a colleague and a friend, um, and we have spent a lot of hours talking about um, everything that he writes about in his book. But 
the reason why this book comes from, I've, I've read many, many, many books about treatment and about trauma, but Bessel um, really challenges the status quo in this book. He challenges the way that we have responded to the notion of trauma in the world. He challenges uh, traditional psychiatry. As a psychiatrist, he challenges traditional psychiatry and um, really uh, asks people to think outside of the box about how we help people to heal. And I think, you know, Bessel's book and my, my relationship with Bessel over the years, which is a, a long-term relationship, has really um, inspired me to, to speak up, to use my voice, to not hesitate in challenging the status quo in hospitals and in organizations and uh, in the mental health field. So I am really grateful for his inspiration and for that book in particular. Mm, thank you. Okay. The last question is, what's a piece of advice you would give 18-year-old Deborah, whether you think she would listen or not in this very moment? Mm, I think my advice would be, come as you are. You don't have to be anything that you're not. You know, bring your whole genuine self to everything that you do. And you don't have to be perfect. I, I am a perf perfectionist in recovery. Uh -huh. <laughs> I've worked hard on letting go of my perfectionism over the years. Uh -huh. And I would love to be able to return to that 18 year old Deborah and say, you know, B pluses are great. Bs are great. Do the best you can. You're perfect as you are. Um, and if you can relax into everything you do, you've got a lot to offer the world and you'll be great. And she ended up being quite great. So great. thank you. <laughs> well, Deborah Korn, thank you so much. People can go to Amazon to buy Every Memory Deserves Respect. They can also go to everymemorydeservesrespect.com and they can read about mm -hmm. you and your co-author. And thank you so much for gracing the airwaves today. This has really been wonderful and really important topic to cover. Yeah. Well, thank you, Keith, for the opportunity to talk about EMDR and the opportunity to reflect with you on uh, issues that, uh, that are worth reflecting on. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. My pleasure. Well, there you have it. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Nurse Keith Show. Remember, head over to nursekeith.com to the drop down menu to read all about Deborah Korn or head over to everymemorydeservesrespect.com. I hope you feel uplifted, empowered, and inspired by this episode. If you need personalized holistic career coaching, head over to nursekeith.com, get in touch, mention the show, and get 10% off your first coaching package. We are a proud member of the Health Podcast Network at healthpodcastnetwork.com. We're adroitly produced by Rob Johnston of 520R Podcasting and Mark Cappy Spiesen is our stalwart social media ringmaster. Before we say goodbye, I'll leave you with this quote by the poet and writer, David White. One of the keys to any possible happiness in work must be the little self-knowledge it takes to know what we desire in life, how we are made and how we belong to the rest of the world. Be well, dig deep, seek joy, keep in touch. This is Nurse Keith saying adios till next time from beautiful Santa Fe, New Mexico. And my friend and new friend of the pod, Deborah Korn, saying Arriva Derchi from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Cambridge, Mass. Thank you so much, Deborah. Thank you to everyone for listening, and we will catch you on the proverbial flip side.